everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight, uh, I'm continuing the study of the Gospel of John, and I'm going to pick up where I left off in chapter 7, beginning with chapter with uh, verse 16. Um, if you haven't seen the previous studies on John, I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. Uh, they're available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Okay. Before I get started, let me ask Brother Stephen to say hi to everybody. Hey, everyone. Long time no see. Brother Stephen here, you know, or as I call myself on YouTube, Stephen Rivers TV. You know, as usual, you know, when I'm here looking forward to a night of, you know, more fellowship, you know, studying and then preaching the gospel and look forward to that in about an hour or so. Okay, brother. Thanks for joining me, and I'll begin right now. Um, I'm a KJV firstist, so I will read it first in the KJV, and we'll discuss it, but I'll probably look at it in the Amplified, too, if I think it will be helpful. So beginning with verse 16, uh, it says, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but this, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his, uh, seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. So uh, Jesus is uh, talking about uh, if you, if you speak about yourself, it could just be taken as like, oh, I'm just bragging and, you know, you, you don't necessarily believe it. If someone is just telling you about themselves, it's better, uh, more reliable if you, if you um, get testimony from other witnesses about them, I believe. Uh, let me read that in the Amplified and then I'll ask you to reply to it. Um, Jesus answered them by saying, my teaching is not my own but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know whether the teaching is of God or whether I speak on my own accord and by my own authority. He who speaks on his own accord seeks glory and honor for himself, but he who seeks the glory of the, uh, and the honor of the one who sent him, he is true, and there is no unrighteousness or deception in him. All right, brother. What's your response to that? Yeah, I like what you said um, when you were talking about that verse 18. You know, he that speaketh of himself seeketh, you know, his own glory. and But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is, is, him, is in him. I liked how you were saying about talking about yourself and bragging because, you know, Jesus pointed out a lot about that's how a lot of the Pharisees were. A lot of them love to like pray out in the streets and really, you know, preach their doctrine. But of course, there a lot of their doctrine, you know, was just man-made, you know, traditions. You know, unlike you know the doctrine of Jesus, which is you know of God. You know, it's from His Father. So, you know, as Jesus said, you know, the Father beareth witness of Him as He beareth witness of the Father. So, like this is you know a you know pure you know and true doctrine, unlike just some you know man-made tradition you know, that people, you know, made up. And, you know, this is the will of the Father that he's doing and not just, you know, his, and not just, you know, a man-made agenda. Well, I recall uh, in some earlier verses, I believe it was in this chapter too, that, um, or in, in this chapter seven also, that, um, I think Jesus made the point that um, he he was not uh, making claims about himself. If if I mean, uh, if you if you make claims about yourself, it doesn't have as much uh, uh, merit or value or cr credibility uh, as if someone else is saying it about you. He said the same kind of thing earlier, re referencing. Uh, who he is, he is and what he's done. And he said, what testifies about me was first John the Baptist told you who I was. 
And then the Holy Spirit has been testifying of me through the, the miracles and his baptism. And now he's saying, talking about his doctrine, well, the doctrine is not mine. Uh, it's, it's my father's doctrine. And so uh, that's he's, he's making the same kind of point now about the father and the doctrine that he's teaching. So let me go on a little further in the scriptures. Um, verse 19 says, Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keepeth the law. Why go ye about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil who goeth about, uh, thou hast a devil who goeth about to kill thee. Okay, well, let's stop there. Just verse 19 and 20. Um, that's pretty clear. We don't even need the Amplified for that. Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keepeth the law. Why go ye about to kill me? <laughs> so, <laughs> Brother Stephen, some interesting points there, huh? Mm, yeah. Well, I mean, no one can keep the law, you know, perfectly. You know, of course, you know, Jesus came you know, to die for us, you know, in our place, because, you know, that's the only way that we could be saved. You know, it's not by the law or by our own righteousness, you know, that anyone's saved. But, you know, the thing is, you know, these Pharisees make up, you know, all of these, you know, man-made traditions and then hold people accountable to that, you know, and say they're breaking the law. But in reality, you know, they on their own are breaking the law. So, I mean, they're being, you know, hypocritical. And, and of course, you know, Jesus is preaching, you know, against them. And, you know, really there's no like earthly reason, you know, I guess that he should have died. Well, obviously he died, you know, to take on our sins, you know, which is the greatest gift we could ever get. But the thing is they go on to kill him because, you know, he's exposing them for who they are. Well, when he says Moses gave you the law, yet none of you are keeping the law. Um, I wonder how many people back then in his audience or um, would first uh, deny that and say, well, we are keeping the law. You remember there is a rich young ruler he had a conversation with, or that's coming up. We haven't discussed it yet in, in the study of John's gospel, but he does have a conversation with the rich young, young, young ruler, and he's unable to admit that he, he hasn't kept the law perfectly. So I wonder how many of these other people are thinking that, wait a second, we are, we are keeping the law. But Jesus is saying, none of you have kept the law. Um, and how many of them think that uh, it is possible to keep the law? Do you, I wonder if any of them are aware that, wait a second, this law is so strict. It is impossible. Jesus is going to teach them that it's impossible. This is what I call the impossible sayings of Jesus. Uh, he, he goes on and on making the point, trying to prove to them <laughs> This following this law, thinking you're going to be justified by following the law, is is a, just a vain attempt because it's impossible. And so I wondered, do you think any of the people thought that that it was actually possible to follow the law? Do you think that some of them thought, like that rich young ruler, that they actually were keeping the law? And then the other question, of course, is is uh, they're denying that people are out to kill him. He knows they are. He's been hiding out in the earlier verses that talked about he didn't want to go into the city because they were going to kill him. And yet uh, now he is. He sneaked into the city. And then now he's talking to everybody and he's saying, you're trying to you want to kill me. Why do you want to kill me? We know the reason he wants to kill. They want to kill him. But let me ask you to respond to all that. I gave you a lot to talk about. Okay, that was really weird. A call just came in on my screen, and I'm sideways. Hold on, let me correct that. Okay, I'm normal now. All right. All right, so the question um, about the how people think they were keeping the law. Well, I mean, I guess the first way I'll answer that is, like, how I see things today. Well, we were, now, this is back then. This is, like, this is not, you know, today, like, you know, when this happened. But, you know, you see these people, you know, who think that, you know, their own righteousness can save them and that by, you know, keeping the commandments and by keeping the law, they can be saved on their own. So, I mean, 
for me, it's not hard to think that, that type of mentality definitely existed, you know, back then. You know, we already talked about, you know, one example, you know, with like the rich man. But I'm trying to recall, you know, if that actually happened. But no, sorry, not that one. But I'm just trying to call like other accounts of it. But for me, I definitely think there would have had to have been a, you know, self-righteous movement, you know, definitely going on back then where people would be, you know, thinking that they could keep the law and thinking that they could be righteous. So to me, that doesn't really seem too foreign. But when it comes to killing him, I mean, it's pretty obvious they're going after him because, you know, he's exposing them, you know, for who we are. And Jesus knows that for sure. But um, it's weird. You know, they, they said it again, like how like they um, used to, you know, thou hast a devil. You know, that's happened, I believe, multiple times, you know, with Jesus. But it's pretty obvious they're coming for him because, you know, he's got them for who they are. Um, I actually need to answer a call, so I'm going to have to exit this for about five or so minutes, but I should be right back. All right. So the the idea of keeping the law is uh, uh, what Jesus is, is discussing here. He says, Moses gave you the law, and yet none of you are keeping it. So uh, I, I believe right now in this section of verses, He's talking to the common people. I didn't see anything in these scriptures leading up to this where he was talking to the the, the Pharisees, the, the most strict uh, religious uh, leaders um, who are known for being very strictly trying to follow the law and being, uh, uh, as Jesus called them, uh, snakes, vipers, whitewashed tombs, hypocrites, because they were demanding everybody follow the, the letter of the law, and yet they, they weren't really doing it themselves, because it is impossible. But I think in this particular section of verses, Jesus is talking to the common people. So it's worth asking ourselves, did the common people believe that uh, they it was possible to follow the law perfectly? And did the... Many of these common people believe the way the rich young ruler did, that he actually was. He said, from my youth, I followed all the laws. Uh, Jesus did put him in his place, make him understand his shortcomings. Um, But then he says, why are you trying to kill me? And they, they deny. Well, who's trying to kill you? Are you crazy? No one's trying to kill you. But Jesus knows they're trying to kill him. They eventually do kill him, and and uh, they they attempt to kill him several times before the cross, and why? Because of his claims. He said, he said, I am my Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He was claiming that he was the Son of God, and they said, you're making yourself equal with God, and that's blasphemy. So the reason they were killing, wanted to kill him, is because of blasphemy. Brother Evan, hi. Hello, brother. Hey, brother. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. <laughs> or at least hear you. I don't really see you, but <laughs> you, you're a fuzzy-faced Christian, you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, some would say that this beard is a sign that I'm a, a, a Calvinist or something. I don't know. I'm not a Calvinist, but. One of those fifteenth-century guys, huh? Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's amazing some of the ideas and claims that people are, are making on YouTube. But I heard someone say that people have beard; they're very suspicious of them. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I wanted to uh, get together with you and Ted t- tonight. I hadn't heard back from either of you about it, so I went on and I'm studying John and picking up where I left off in John chapter seven. And uh, I picked up with verse 16, and now I've just read all the way to um, 20. Okay, so, uh, a, a word about um, um, Tedford. Um, he, he didn't specify that he'd be available this Friday. Uh, he just said the best nights is probably Friday evenings, but didn't say we'll do it this Friday. 
Uh, and I never, I made the mistake of not asking him, it, would he do it this Friday? Because I just got so many things going on right now. My mind is just being torn in 20 directions. So I'm, uh, I'm a little bit frazzled. And so I didn't ask him. So I, I, I don't expect him to be making himself available tonight for any specific reason. Maybe he can be. I don't know. Uh, well, yeah, I, I wasn't uh, trying to I can impose it on every, on you guys. I just I was I was kind of uh, not sure whether you guys were planning on this Friday or not. So I was trying to be flexible. Yeah. And, uh, since since Ted's not available, of course, uh, we want to have Ted and you and I, the three of us, are going to do a teaching on uh, the question of the the state of the dead and we're going to be uh, going into great detail it'll probably take five or ten hours of studies uh, uh, to get through it all but we'll, we'll be uh, looking at the the, uh, the uh, doctrine of eternal torment examining that comparing that to the doctrine of annihilationism we're going to look ask is the soul immortal or or, or are we born as mortals? And we're going to ask also, uh, between death and eternity, uh, is there an uh, unconscious state or a conscious state of the soul? So those are the things that we'll be discussing, and I'm looking forward to it. I, and I don't know when it'll begin, but it'll probably be Friday nights, as soon as Brother Ted and uh, Brother Evan and I can get the schedule coordinated. So... Uh, before I go back into John, I'll let you respond to what I just said. Okay, uh, that's sound, yeah. I'm looking forward to it very much. It's a it's a very I think important subject, and uh, there's a there's a lot of verses in the Bible that speak about it. A lot of verses in the Bible. It should be very interesting, and I hope we get a lot of viewers that'll pay attention, uh, that'll listen in, and uh, and pay attention to the things, the verses that we provide, and uh, the, the way that uh, we're able to show uh, what what they're what these passages are talking about, and maybe maybe somebody will learn something about God's word they didn't know. I think it'll be. I'm really looking forward to it. All right, me too. So um, that's coming coming in the near future, probably on Friday nights. But right now, John chapter 7, verses 16 through 20, I'll read them. Uh, I've discussed them quite a bit myself already. I'll get your reaction to it. I'll just read it com completely through. Uh, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keepeth the law. Why, why go ye about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil. Who goeth about to kill thee? Go ahead, brother. I know I gave you a lot. I've already spent about 15 minutes discussing these verses, so I'll just get your reaction to it uh, before we move on. Well, uh, I'm, uh, I would have to say that uh, Jesus was always right. You know, everything he said is right. So if they were uh, setting about to kill him, then uh, th that's the truth. Of course, what they're going to say is they're not. You know, but Jesus knows better. He, he knows what's in their heart. Just remember, there was a verse. What was that passage somewhere? I forgot which book it's in, where uh, they, they, they were mumbling to themselves, and Jesus was reading their hearts, and he was knowing what it was that they were setting about in their heart, and he, he, he responded something they said, knowing that they were trying to, you know, trip him up or whatnot. So he, he's, he's right. It sounds to me like they're making an excuse uh, for, uh, for their the covert uh, uh, motivations in their heart when they say, why, why would we wish to do such a thing? Uh-oh, I can't hear you. Yeah, he's still muted. Uh, oh, there you go. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm okay now, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, let me go back to the chapter 21. Ver, uh, uh, chapter 7, verse 21 in the KJV says, Jesus answered and said unto them, 
I have done one work, and ye all marvel. Moses uh, therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receiveth circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? All right, some interesting points there. Uh, I'll let you guys take turns responding on that. I'll let you know Evan go first. Uh, no, go for it. I was reading something. I'm sorry at the time. Um, I, it sounds to me like uh, Jesus is just putting these guys in their place, though. I may have missed something. I'm sorry. All right. Well, yeah, I definitely agree with that. You know, putting them, you know, in their place right there. I mean, he's. I think it's a really good point. You know, in you know verse uh, 23. How it says, if a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, you know, which is something given to them by Moses, you know, that the law of Moses should not be broken. You know, why are you angry at me because I've, you know, because I've done something good because I made a man whole. So it's like, you know, they're mad because he performed a work, but yet they themselves, you know, will do these works. So, you know, um, you know, like their laws can be fulfilled. So at the same way, like, you know, if they're going to be, you know, hypocrites, you know, why are they getting angry at him? You know, he's just really showing them, I guess, like how absurd really like their traditions are, you know, and just like how like their doctrine, you know, really is. Like, what's your comment, um, Luke or Evan? Well, he, uh, this, this is one of many arguments that will take place between Jesus and the people. Usually it's Jesus versus the religious leaders like the Pharisees and arguing about the things Jesus does on the Sabbath that they they claim he's he's violating the rest on the Sabbath law and and so this is just one of many times this will this comes up uh, and yet he points out to them he says don't you don't you circumcise on the Sabbath <laughs> just to give them example look, you're working on the Sabbath and he, he's going to explain another case and uh, uh, of these occasions that are coming up uh, how absurd it is that, that they are accusing him of violating the Sabbath and I, they don't understand basically really the whole point of the Sabbath the Sabbath was um, not for um, for God's sake it was for man's sake so he could rest but not because he had had to rest and uh, he uh, and you know you don't if you have a chance to do some good on the Sabbath like heal someone <laughs> you know if you don't say I'm not going to do good just because it's the Sabbath so mm -hmm. he really illustrates the absurdity of how they they take things they uh, as he says they they understand the letter of the law but they don't understand the heart of the law they don't understand the real point of it right and, and that's like the the, the passage that says. Uh, where he said, uh, you know, if a man loses a sheep down a hole, would he not go get it out, Sabbath or not? You know, uh, so you're exactly right. They understand the letter, not the meaning of it, not the, not not the heart of it. And uh, he, they're they're just they're they're uh, puffed up. You know, they they see themselves as the ones keepers of the law and everything, but uh, absolutely don't. Uh, they, they don't. They're not just. Uh, teachers of the Israeli people according to the word and and Jesus is, is happy to show this <laughs> yeah he he said uh, in just one of these earlier verses we just discussed that he says Moses gave you the laws and yet not one of you keeps the law and I asked the question I said well uh, I wonder in the general population um, if, if very many of them actually thought, number one, it was really possible to keep the law perfectly, and number two, that some people were actually doing it and accomplishing it. It seemed that the rich young ruler, he claimed he was following it all perfectly since his youth. Um, but we know that the very religious, the Pharisees, you know, they had this real pious, self-righteous attitude that Jesus condemned. Uh, but I don't know in the general population, right now in this section, I don't see anything where he's talking to the Jewish religious leaders 
there's no reference to uh, the Syracese. I think he's just talking to the common people. But what this really makes me think of is what uh, we've really been dealing with a lot the last week or two here on YouTube. We've had a lot of hangouts uh, earlier in the day. Brother Sam, Brother Bill, and I have been participating in them. And, and really, we're, all we're doing is going back to Jesus' time and dealing with the same kind of people. Because the people today are no, no different, even those people who claim Jesus is their Savior. And yet they're just like these people, still hung up on the law, thinking that, uh, one, uh, it's possible to follow the law completely, and two, they're doing it, and uh, they're going to judge whether you're doing it well enough or not. So we've been arguing against the fruit inspectors and the lordship salvationists, and, and it just reminds me, as I read this, <laughs> nothing's changed. People with these these uh, legalists who really think so much of themselves that they're I'm capable of knowing right and wrong and doing right and you know instead of understanding with Jesus none of you are keeping the law that's what he keeps telling them he he finally says it's impossible that's why I have a video titled the impossible sayings of Jesus he wants to make it clear to everybody that it is impossible for you to um, please God through your own work, through your religion, through all your efforts uh, to please God so that you're acceptable. You, you have to reject that and say it's impossible. Just like you had the, the, the Pharisee praying, oh, God, I'm not happy. I'm not like these other people. I, I fast. I give alms. And, and then you had the publican that he wouldn't even lift up his head to God. He just bent down and cried, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he said, it's that second man that's justified. So mm -hmm. Jesus is tr really, his, 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 if you really think and keep that in perspective, as you're reading all the words of Jesus, you should understand that he's not teaching us to follow laws. He's teaching us the impossibility of following the laws, and therefore we have to just throw up our hands in defeat say, I need help. I need a Savior who happens to be Jesus Christ. Yeah. yeah, it's, um, oh, wait a minute. My hand's on the wrong side. Hold on, let me flip this thing over. There we go. Um, yeah, because, like, and a lot of people, let's say, get this stuff, you know, backwards. They look at, you know, some of his verses and they sit there and act like, oh, it's talking about how we have to do the work, how we have to be obedient, you know, and we have to, you know, do everything. But in reality, you know, Luke said it just right. He was showing them actually that they need him, that they can't do it themselves. You know, it's impossible, you know, because Jesus, you know, paid it all, you know, and the gift of, you know, the gift of God, you know, of everlasting life, it's a gift. You know, something that he paid for, and we need that. You know, it's not something we can earn on our own. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this in the Amplified to see how it's phrased. This section here, um, for, starting with verse 19, it says, "Did not Moses give you the law, and yet not not one of you keeps the law? Why do you want to kill me for not keeping it?" The crowd answered, you have a demon. You are out of your mind. Who wants to kill you? Jesus replied, I did one work and you were all astonished. Uh, for this reason, Moses has given you God's law regarding circumcision. Not that it originated with Moses, but with the patriarchs. And you circumcise a man even on the Sabbath, if, it, if to avoid breaking the law of Moses. A man undergoes circumcision on the Sabbath. Why are you angry with me for making a man's whole body well on the Sabbath? Do not judge by appearance superficially and arrogantly, but judge fairly and righteously. So that last verse in the Amplified is, I didn't read it in the KJV, so I went one verse farther than I had. But that gives you a pretty good understanding of what's really going on in this conversation here. Um, uh, now, when it talks about doing, giving righteous judgments, this is a this is another important question that we should we should discuss is judging. But but before we get into that, 
everything that came before that last verse. Let me give you a final response to that before I go on. Just more of the same, if you ask me. He's continuously pointing out that uh, uh, the, that they're not keeping the law. Nobody's keeping the law. Somebody's got to keep the law. He's going to do it. But uh, the law is for man, uh, not God. And uh, and uh, they're quick to point out that they know the, the written letter of the law, but they're just endlessly missing the 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 whole point of the the thing. Well, let me let me say one thing about the circumcision that was I, I recalled as I read the Amplified. In the KJV, it, uh, it wasn't as clear to me, but he's he's saying you circumcise on the Sabbath. A person could think that it's the Jewish custom to always do a circumcision on the Sabbath, but that's not really what the verse was saying. It says you circumcise even on the Sabbath. Now, why would it say that? Because circumcision, the law says you circumcise the, the male child on the eighth day of life. And, and so if that eighth day fell on the Sabbath, they would say, okay, even though it's the Sabbath, we'll do it. So he's saying that you'll even do some work on the Sabbath so that you can follow the other law that uh, is uh, saying you must circumcise on the eighth day. Now, I'll, here's an interesting point that... Uh, you may or may not be aware of, but back then they they didn't know anything about uh, uh, the biological uh, characteristics of a, of a child, how they how the blood clotting factor works. Uh, it was just the law was they circumcise a child on the eighth day, but now scientists know that uh, it's the eighth day that takes that much time for a child to to reach a point where they've maximized the ability for the blood. To clot. So here's another example right. of the Bible telling man to do a certain thing in a certain way, and then science catches up a couple of thousand years later. That's, That's what right. the Bible was teaching. Amen. Eight days. God said to circumcise on the eighth day, and that's science tells us that's when the, the, the hemoglobin starts to kick in, and uh, the, uh, the, the bleeding will, will stop. Otherwise, they bleed out. So, again, like you said, science catching up with the Bible. Okay, now I want to ask you about this verse about judging here. He says, verse 24, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Or as it's phrased in the Amplified, do not judge by appearance superficially and arrogantly, but judge fairly and righteously. There's other judging verses that we find in the scriptures too, but getting back to how I'm applying this, uh, th these uh, events of almost 2,000 years ago to what we deal with even today, uh, even this week, um, dealing with people who are legalists, the modern day Pharisees uh, and fruit inspectors always want to judge other people's salvation by examining their lives and, and it's, and they're judging. Uh, I'll tell you how I judge someone's salvation. I say, do you think you're going to go to heaven and why? I want to, I want to find out, what is your faith in? If they say, well, I believe that I'm going to go to heaven because I'm going to be a good, good enough person that God will let me in because I'm good enough. See, they're, they're, their faith is in themselves. But if they say to me, well, uh, I'm, I'm going to go to heaven but it's because of what Jesus has done for me and his promises. He died for my sins. I'm trusting him. See, I'm not going to judge someone's salvation, whether I think that they, they drink too much beer or they're, they eat too much food and they're gluttons or they've committed adultery or any of these things. We, don't, we do not uh, determine someone's salvation from these outward appearances. We, we determine sal someone's salvation by their confession of faith. We test their faith. Are they in the faith? Is their faith in Jesus or is their faith still in following religion and being religious and, and hoping that they're, they're, they are accepted by God? But my question is, we're dealing with these people even today and the question of judging. Are we supposed to be judging each other at all? And how, how, how does judging apply to us uh, to, today? 
Well, I get, I have some things in mind. I want to go more detail, but let me just get your general response to that. Well, that's all. Everything, uh, everything you said is spot on. Uh, I, I think the Bible gives us one example of uh, judging, and it tells us, you know, to address a brother privately at first. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that uh, uh, this would be an obvious uh, outward thing. And if I'm not mistaken, the passage implies that these people are making them so, a show of their sinfulness when they're amongst the brethren in the church. Uh, I might be wrong about that. And, and and this would be a clear sign that there's a situation that needs addressing. But every, uh, I might be wrong about that, uh, the circumstances for it. But uh, you're absolutely right. It's by faith in Christ alone that uh, we uh, obtain the grace of God for salvation. And so if somebody's putting putting their faith in themselves, well, they're, they've missed out because there's no way they're going to ever make it. They're not going to keep the law of God perfectly, and that's the requirement. It's his perfection, God's holiness, and the standard is way too high for man to attain. So Christ did it in our place. Faith has to be in him. Put it in yourself, and you've lost. All right. Well, welcome, Brother Ted. Uh, I saw that you were able to join us, and we had Brother uh, Stephen was with us, and he disappeared. So sometimes he gets phone calls he's got to take, so that's probably why he, he left. Um, well, Brother, we were talking about you behind your back. Did you Were you aware of that? <laughs> You got to unmute your mic if you want us to hear you. You're, you can, can you click on your mic and mute, unmute it? All right. We were talking about you earlier, saying that uh, the uh, the study we want to do between the three of us, some point here. I I thought Fridays would be a good night. I wasn't sure if we'd start tonight or some future date, but Friday nights we're going to do that study on eternal torment. Uh, the immortality or mortality of the soul, mm -hmm. the state of the state of the the dead, where either conscious or unconscious, uh, sure. and we're going to do that. So uh, that's why we we're talking about you. So uh, you can just be, be relaxed. When we talk behind your back, <laughs> it's always good things. <laughs> well, that's fine. Sorry, I'm late. We had something going on at the church, and glad, and I I signed up on the wrong page. I was. I was on on the hangout, but as as a guest on on the wrong page, so I'm starting to get the hang of this. But yeah, Evan uh, texted me the other day and uh, told me you guys want to do that, and uh, I'm thinking I'm thinking Friday night may be best for now, uh, but if you know, let's just uh, see if that works for you guys. And uh, I've been getting into some stuff, so we can approach that subject as soon as you want to. All right. Uh, now just mute your mic again whenever someone else is talking. Otherwise, we get feedback. But, uh, yeah, okay, what we'll do is we'll just make a, a, a flexible schedule. Let's plan on doing it Friday nights. It'll probably take us at least five or ten Friday nights to get through it all. There's a lot of material. And I have an outline I want to follow, but then you guys add all your material in as we go along, and so it'll be uh, really quite, uh, quite extensive. Um, okay, but for now, Brother Ted, um, I don't know if you've listened at all, but we're in John chapter 7, and we've had quite a good discussion already. Uh, we started with verse 16, and now we're all the way up to verse 24. And the question I'm asking everybody is about judging. Jesus says, uh, judge righteous judgments, not by, don't judge by appearances. And this last week, I've been very busy earlier in the day uh, joining Brother uh, Bill and Brother Sam's hangouts, uh, uh, confronting fruit inspectors and lordship salvationists who want to judge other people's salvation, and they're judging it wrongly. We, we all, the only way of de determining if someone is saved or not is not by judging how well they're living their lives or how how much sin or lack of sin there is, that's not the test. The, the test is, what do you believe in? And most people are still believing in themselves. They think, well, if I'm good enough, God will accept me. 
But I'm saying no. My test, if, if I want to say I believe that person saved, is based solely on their confession of faith. If they say, I'm going to go to heaven because of my faith in Jesus and what he did for me, and I'm trusting in him entirely, and then, then that satisfies me, and I believe that person is saved, regardless of how they're living their life. Uh, so that's the, that's the way I judge someone's salvation. And some people say you shouldn't judge them all, but that's really what we should be do, judging on. Or, or do you think you're going to go to heaven and why? Now, how do we find out who to even witness to if we don't ask them that question? <laughs> you know, I think that's completely fair because really that's just putting the gospel in a nutshell right there. And, and, and you know, if they believe the gospel, that, that's where they get the salvation, uh, believing on Christ. So uh, that is the, the, the simple and truest test of, of whether or not somebody is a Christian. I think it's absolutely completely fair to ask, you know, what is their, your faith in? Because that's the very basis of it all anyway, right there. But uh, I've enjoyed talking to you. I've got a cut out here, and, uh, and, and I've been invited to another hangout with somebody who was kind of expecting me to do something. I told him I didn't know if I could, but it looks like I can. Since we're not talking about the, the, the state of the dead, the hell, uh, the uh, situation, uh, circumstance tonight, uh, subject matter, I mean, uh, I'm going to go ahead and take off, but I appreciate you letting me come in and talk to you while I did. You're a blessing to me, brother. You guys have a good evening. I'll catch you real soon, maybe this coming Friday night. I'll be in touch with you guys by email. How's that? All right. All right. Bless you, brother. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. Be before I continue on in these verses, that was verse 24, let me give Brother Ted and Brother Stephen a chance to respond to that about uh, judging I can go first if you want. That's fine. Okay. Uh, well, I think the uh, the context of, of the Gospels, of course, Jesus and his audience, uh, a lot of the, uh, the narratives always included uh, the Pharisees. And um, so, therefore, um, and I'm sure I haven't looked at this immediate context, but I'm sure... Uh, even if Pharisees weren't there, they were so much a part of the culture and so much a part of the uh, pervasive uh, situational uh, uh, you know, things going on there that, uh, of course, he had to, uh, to speak against judging and self-righteousness like you were talking about uh, when I came on board. You were talking about the, the Pharisee in the temple praying how Jesus gave the parable of the Pharisee versus the publican's prayer, and it all came down to a matter of attitude. A matter of the heart, and uh, so obviously uh, Jesus says here at the end of verse 24 to judge righteous judgment, and I think we just have to put that you know you know that's what he's saying there. He's saying judge righteous judgment as opposed to the judgment of like a Pharisee, a self-righteous person who judges not righteously but unrighteously. And it's, it's self-righteously. So that's what I would say about that. Okay, Brother Stephen, what's your response to that before we move on? Yeah, I like what, you know, Ted was just talking about right there. Um, you know, a lot of the times I like to see people, like, I, sorry, I don't like to, I see people who really love to judge people, you know, like by their works, you know, by their deeds, you know, and by their lifestyles. And, of course, mostly I see that, you know, in worship, you know, salvationists. And, you know, of course, a lot of these Pharisees, this was because it was like their own laws, you know, and like what they like to do. But the thing is, instead of judging them by, you know, by like, you know, the faith that they might, that they put, you know, in Jesus, you know, and in God, you know, they're judging them based on, you know, like, you know, like what, like, as he said, like, by appearance, like like what they look like on the outside by their works, which is, you know, not how we are to judge someone. We're only supposed to, you know, we're supposed to judge, you know, by faith, and we're not supposed to be hypocrites. But yet, you know, these Pharisees, you know, were big time hypocrites. Yeah, well, brother, brother Ted, what you said was kind of real condensed version of what I've been saying for the most of this study today. That if you go back to verse 16 and read it all through. You'll, you'll see that, that that was kind of a summary of, of what's going on here. And in fact, there are no Pharisees on the scene 
in these verses that uh, they may be there but they're not mentioned so this is the common people and the common people the question I was asking was he says uh, Moses gave you the law but yet none of you are following the law and and so uh, um, I was wondering do you think that the common people one believed that it was possible to really follow the law perfectly and number two did some of them think that they were actually doing it now we know there's one example at least not counting the Pharisees but there's one example that rich young ruler until Jesus put him in his place and told him everybody that it's impossible Jesus said that's the point Jesus is making he wants everybody to understand the the law was given to you but you you can't really follow it's impossible that's why you need a savior uh, but do you think the po common people it's like common today for people to think that okay the law is pretty simple um, uh, even people who are not Christians or don't study the Bible or don't attend church they think oh it's pretty simple just be a good person just do unto others as you would have them do unto you and God will accept you then you know so they they think that they is possible and they're doing it so these people here what do you think about them what's your speculation well I'm gonna say the, the ones that were honest <laughs> and uh, had any self-awareness knew that they couldn't fully keep the law otherwise why would they uh, go to uh, the Day of Atonement every year uh, to have the high priest sacrifice for their personal sins and for the sins of the people collectively. I think the ones that were honest uh, knew they couldn't keep the law and they also just intuitively knew that the uh, Pharisees were hypocrites and that the uh, they probably saw some of the self-righteousness and the, and the uh, for lack of a better word showiness uh, of the Pharisees and I think that's one of the reasons Jesus appealed to much of the masses so much at least you know for a while at that time what do y'all think yeah I definitely like that but I mean I feel like you know just when it comes to most of this stuff like like we've all been you know talking about this you know mostly like especially when it comes to like and I love that point you know there's no point, you know, in having the atonement every year if everybody could perfectly, you know, keep the law. But yet there were some people, you know, that were deluded enough to think that they could. Just like, you know, today I see people, you know, on YouTube who think that they've stopped sinning. And they think that, you know, like their own righteousness, you know, saves you. And they preach, you know, of course they also preach the Bible is not the word of God. But, so I mean, you'll see a bunch of like, you know, these types of heresies. But if it's happening today, it was definitely happening, you know, back then too. Yeah, so the, the, the two questions I asked, and we've tried to been answering these questions for the last 30 minutes, really, is, is uh, um, are, are there people who really believe that, that it's possible to keep the law perfectly? Because Jesus pointed out to them, Moses gave you the law, yet none of you are keeping it. Uh, and then uh, of those people who think that they are, that it is possible, are some of them actually confident? Oh, I'm really doing it. I'm, I'm doing it. Well, we know that the rich young ruler claimed he did it. We know that the Pharisees claimed that they were doing it. And we know, as Brother Ted pointed out, that there's also a group of people that realized they couldn't do it. These are the people that realized they needed Jesus to be their savior. This is the publican that, that cried out, God have mercy on me, a sinner. He was not like the, the Pharisee who thought, yeah, we can keep the law, and I'm the one that's doing it. Look at me. <laughs> you know? So there were all kinds at that time, and there's all kinds today. Uh, the three of us and Brother Evan, who had to leave, we're, we're like the publican. We understand that it's hopeless. Oh, God, have mercy on me, a sinner, because I know it's impossible to keep the law, or what I would, I would rephrase it and say, it's impossible for me to go to judgment and say, I've been perfect my whole life. <laughs> if we can't go before God at the end and say I've been perfect my whole life then you should re realize that uh, your hopeless situation 
And that's what the publican realized. And he said, oh, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And that's what we all do as Christians. We come to the conclusion we just need to appeal to God to have mercy and give us salvation because we can't do it and we need him to do it for us. And there is a way that he did it. I'm going to let Brother Stephen tell us about that because I know he looks forward to a few minutes in the end to tell people the good news. Uh, so I'll, I'll do that now. Uh, so verse 24 about uh, righteous judgment, that will be the, the last verse tonight. And we'll pick up uh, next time in John, in Ch John chapter 7, verse 25. Um, but Brother Stephen, um, I want the people to understand that if they want to try to get to heaven through on their own merit, based upon how well they behave and how well they perform and go before God and, and say, judge me, judge me, and I'm sure that I did good enough and I deserve heaven. I want them to understand that that's impossible. They all fall short of the glory of God, the scripture says, and they'll found, be found lacking. So if they can't please God and satisfy God's requirement uh, through their own efforts, what hope do they have, brother? All right, this is my favorite part, you know, of every night. And yep, Luke just turned on his, you know, icon, which I'm sure he'll keep up, which shows you know, the hand stretched out to the nail scarred hand of Jesus. All right, well, as per usual, I like to always start off reading John 3:16 every time I present the gospel, which is you know the good news, you know, of Jesus Christ. Although for us, it's not just good news; it's amazing news because it's the greatest gift you know any of us could ever get. For as it says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, as we were talking about tonight, a lot of people, you know, I see it today, you know, in YouTube and, you know, other places, and, you know, even back then, people thought they could keep the law, and they thought, you know, like their own righteousness could save them, and they thought, you know, it's, you know, self-righteousness. But I've got, you know, a couple verses that is going to completely, you know, wipe that out. And like this will, let's say Romans 3:10 puts, you know, everybody in their place, you know, really quickly. Romans 3:10 says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. And Romans 3:23 says, you know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's another verse I can't remember the number as of right now that says that our works are nothing but, you know, filthy rags. You know, so but that really puts it in perspective. Our best works, the best thing we try to do on our own to please God, our best efforts to keep the law, trying to be perfect on our own, that's like a filthy rag. You know, if you put, if you bring up a moldy rag that's just dirty and throw it in front of me, I'm not going to want to touch it. You know, and let's say that's basically, you know, how good our own works are in comparison to God. They're nothing. And besides that, you know, we're too, well, let's say we're so small in this universe, we're like a speck of dust. This universe is so huge, but yet, you know, God created this universe, and he is, as I've said before, there's no creation that tops its creator. So that just really shows, you know, like the big, you know, difference. You know, as it says in Romans 6, 23, I'll read the first half, for the wages, you know, of sin, you know, is death. Of course, in this Exodus, it's talking about, you know, not just the physical death, but eternal death. And it says it's the wages of sin. But now, but the good news is in the second half. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, you see, Jesus came here and did what we couldn't do. You know, he said, you know, it's impossible on our own. So he did it for us. You know, he came here being fully God. Yet at the same time, being in the flesh and being fully man. But it's, it's, such, it's such amazing to comprehend the eternal God coming here, you know, came here in the flesh he lived a life we couldn't live. He was sinless. He was perfect. He was pleasing to his Father. You know, he performed many miracles. But then he did the ultimate sacrifice for us. He came here. He died on the cross. He shed his blood for us, for as we were talking about, I believe it was that in Isaiah that blood must be shed. You know, no, wait, maybe it was Hebrews. But anyway, he shed his blood for us and died for us. He was buried, but then three days later he rose again, proving that, you know, who he was. He was the Son of God, and he had the power over life and death, that he could quickeneth whom he will. And, but when he died, 
he put all the sins of the world on him so that we might be saved. And, you know, he paid it all for us. And he offers us the gift of everlasting life. And he, ta and he tells us plainly how to get it. As it says in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And I don't think it can get much, any much simpler than that or any plainer than that. You know, Jesus, and this is Jesus promising it to us. And he will not take back his promise and he won't lie. He says that if we believe and trust on him and him alone, we have salvation. And that's the only way we can be saved. For as, G, you know, as Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man will come to the Father but by me, because he paid it all. And of course, just to you know, bring it on further, you know, in Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. It's not do your own works and thou shalt be saved, and not be righteous and holy on your own. Keyword, on your own, and you'll be saved. But it's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, take him at his word, you know, and trust in him. And you will be, you know, saved and set free. And the greatest part of, you know, the salvation is it's everlasting. First, Jesus said in John 10, 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Once you're saved, you're saved forever, and you're eternally sealed. And that's the greatest news that you could ever get. Jesus came. He died for you. He buried, rose again, and you know to pay for the sins that we that we cannot do because we're not righteous. And he offers us a gift of everlasting life that never goes away if we will believe and trust on him. And that's the beauty and the simpleness of the gospel. And that's the invitation I give out to everyone here tonight: believe on Jesus, come to him, trust in him, and live. And that's all I have. All right, so the word gospel is just uh, simply, it's a Greek word, and it means good news. I hope if you listen to Brother Stephen's message there that you, you uh, ended up feeling that you were told really good news, that uh, salvation, eternal life in heaven is offered to each one of us as a free gift from Jesus Christ. And uh, the reason that we have confidence that our faith is justified is because of the resurrection. He promised that he would give us a sign to prove that his claims were true. He said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And they said, well, it took 40 years to build a temple. How can you raise it in three days? But the scripture says he was talking about his body, his death, burial, and resurrection. And when he raised himself back to life on the third day, uh, that was the sign that gives us confidence that our faith in Jesus is justified. And I know the resurrection is true because he, uh, he walked among 500 witnesses for 40 days, and they, they saw him, they talked to him, uh, they ate with him, they spoke with him. They, uh, it's that resurrection, that bodily resurrection that proves he is God, he is Savior, he has power over life and death, and he's offering you life everlasting in heaven if you'll just trust him. I'll ask Brother Ted if he has any final words before we say goodnight. No, that's good, Brother, and thank you, Brother Stephen, for that very clear gospel presentation. Appreciate that. All right, brothers, thank you for uh, joining me tonight, and viewers, thank you for watching, and I hope you will uh, join us nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time, uh, for more episodes of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.